War, you know, they say is not like the movies. And training for war, I assure you, is nothing like the commercials. The Marine Corps recruiting commercials always show long sequences of Marines doing like really cool things, shooting guns and crawling under barbed wire and rappelling down walls. When I was a kid, the Marines had a commercial where a Marine officer candidate runs across a metal pipe over a pit of lava, grabs a sword, and then out of the pit of lava, this like giant fire monster comes out and he stabs it with the sword and kills it. It's awesome, and you should YouTube it. Now, to be fair to the recruiters, I did do some of that stuff. I got to shoot guns, uh, I got to crawl under barbed wire, and um, are there any Marines in the audience, by the way? Anybody? No one. Okay, then I can tell you. Yeah, we kill a fire monster. Um, but at the end of the day, military training is less about doing cool things than it is about enduring really unpleasant ones. Enduring the cold, the rain, the heat, the bugs, the infamous swamp ass. And if you don't know what swamp ass is, all I will say is that it is well named. There are other things to endure, exhaustion and stress and forced marches, but mostly it's about enduring boredom. Lots and lots of boredom. Lying in the prone, behind no, your rifle, sure camo I paint on your face, hiding in the there. woods, that's exciting for about 40 seconds. And then the novelty wears yeah. off, and it's freaking boring. Sitting at the rifle range all day is freaking boring. Humping is really boring. And if you're a civilian and don't. you don't know what that means, I'm sad to say that humping is not what you think it is. <laughs> but I had a solution. I decided that I would memorize poetry. I'd print out poems, cut them up into index card sized pieces, laminate them, and put them in my pocket before we went on a field exercise with a little card of poetry in my hand. I'd be sitting behind my rifle, my eyes on my sector of fire like I was supposed to, and then I'd look down, read a line of poetry, and recite it in my head while I, you know, looked out at the Quantico woods. It was great. I started out with small poems, a little bit of Yeats, some Charles Olson, but that was too easy. There was just way too much boredom. So I said, screw it, I'm memorizing The Wasteland, T.S. Eliot's long modernist poem. And this is a testament to how much boredom there is at the basic school. That's exactly what I did. Now, I was definitely a weirdo, but I only really caught flack for this once. We're on a field exercise waiting for a helicopter to pick us up. There were a couple platoons ahead of us. We're sitting around amusing ourselves as best we could. One guy had a really tattered maxim. One guy was trying to see how much dip he could fit into his lip at one time. One guy was scratching his nuts with both hands. Like, both hands. And I was memorizing the wasteland. So this captain comes by. He's one of our trainers. He's an infantry officer. He's been to Iraq. He's been in combat. This big, ripped, angry looking guy. We're all scum in his eyes, OK? And he's looking out at us like he's trying to decide who he should be most disgusted by. And what everybody else is doing is kind of self-explanatory, but I've got those cards. So he, he walks up to me, and he asks me what I'm doing, and I tell this battle-hardened captain, responsible for getting us ready for war, oh, I'm memorizing poetry. I don't know what he was expecting me to say, but that wasn't it. So, you know, I'm like, oh, this is what I do during downtime. It's a little weird, I know. And he's coming to a definite opinion about this activity of mine. He doesn't like it. So he barks out at me, oh, you like memorizing stuff? What are the elements of a nine line? Have you memorized that? For those of you who don't know, a nine line is how you request a medical evacuation. It has nine elements, none of which I know. So he says, when one of your Marines is dying, what are you going to do, recite poetry? To which I responded, no, that hadn't been the plan. But here's the thing, we hadn't been taught the nine line yet. And sure, I could have taken the initiative and memorized all kinds of random military stuff, but that wasn't required. I mean, this was downtime, right? Why was he picking on me? It's not like the guy scratching his nuts was doing something that would one day keep his Marines alive. <laughs> Whatever. I got out my platoon commander's notebook, and I started to memorize the nine line. Now, it kind of amuses me to think of that captain now, but I get where he's coming from. 
I really do. I have an unusual job for a veteran. A lot of the vets I know are men of action. When Hurricane Sandy hit New York the other year, I was in the city. It wasn't too bad for me. I lost power for a bit. No big deal. A couple weeks afterwards, I met up with a friend who'd served in Iraq and Afghanistan. I asked him what he'd been up to. No, he says nonchalantly, I've been working with Team Rubicon. It's this veteran-led disaster response organization. And he starts explaining how he was going out with teams into the city to coordinate aid for stranded people in, in some of the outer neighborhoods of the city who were just you know, left without help and sometimes without food or water. Then he pauses and he goes, so what have you been up to? At this point, I would have preferred he hadn't asked me because all I had to say for myself was writing stories. Now, I've been in this spot a lot. There are enough vets out there doing really incredible work that it tends to make me feel like a bit of an asshole. What have I been doing with my life? And yet at the same time, I feel that storytelling is one of the most vital responsibilities we have. And I use the word responsibility very deliberately. Because you don't just go to war, experience whatever it is you experience, and then come back. You go to war with all the stories of war you've got rattling around in your head. You try to use those stories to make sense of what's happening. And then you come back to all the stories about war that our culture is telling itself. I'm, I'm just and those stories matter. There's a great bit in Karl Melantis' book, What It's Like to Go to War, where he, where he says, ask the 20-year-old combat veteran what it feels like to kill a man, and his probable angry answer, if he's being honest, is it doesn't feel like a fucking thing. But if you ask that same veteran that same question 20, 30, 40 years down the road, you might get a very different answer. And it's not just going to depend on who that veteran is and what he experienced. It's also going to depend on the kind of community he had around him. And that community will be shaped by the stories that we tell ourselves about war. I don't know if memorizing the wasteland made me a better officer. I do know that many of the best Marines I knew were readers. It's not surprising. The act of reading literature is the attempt to empathetically engage with other experience and to deeply think about what that means. It's, ex it's essential to leadership. And I don't just mean in a simple tactical sense, like Grant at Shiloh imagining the psychological weakness of the Confederate line. And I'm not even talking about the sort of empathetic engagement necessary for counterinsurgency, learning to read other people and cultures like a map. I'm talking about what comes after. What do you do when you're struggling to find the words to explain <clears throat> to the father of a fallen Marine exactly what that Marine meant to you? What do you do when one of your best Marines calls to tell you he's been drinking too much, that he feels isolated at college, surrounded by 18-year-olds he can't make sense of and who can't make sense of him? What do you do when the middle school students that you're teaching <clears throat> excitedly ask you when they learn that you're a veteran if you've ever killed anyone and are horribly disappointed when you say no? When complete strangers at a bar insist on treating you as though you must be horribly psychologically damaged just because you're a vet. When veterans you know with post-traumatic stress find that they can't express their legitimate feelings of rage and grief about some of the things that have happened recently without having those feelings being dismissed as symptoms. What do you do when a Marine you've never met before tells you he can't get over his guilt over the suicide of a Marine he served with? When a friend learns that a translator he worked with, <clears throat> who repeatedly risked his life for US troops and then was denied a visa, that that translator and his two eldest male children were executed by militants who found out that he used to work for the Americans. No work of literature will be able to give you those answers, but it can prepare you to start asking those questions. I've met veterans from Vietnam, from Korea, from World War II. They haven't stopped asking themselves those same sorts of questions since the day they got home. And we're not going to get any more responsible about war unless we all, civilians and veterans alike, start asking ourselves those questions too. War is too strange to be processed alone. And whether we like it or not, we're all involved. If you voted for a Bush or you voted for Obama, or you're a taxpayer paying for the wars, or even if you're someone who doesn't follow the wars at all. And in fact, maybe I should say, especially if you're someone who doesn't follow the wars at all. These are your wars. I met a Marine at an event recently. who's a big guy, tough looking vet. Must have been the perfect image of a Marine in dress blues. And he stood up and he said, I'm a Marine veteran of Iraq. That used to be something I was incredibly proud of. If you'd asked me just a few years ago to make a resume of my life, not a resume for a job, just a accounting of who I was, 
All the biggest bullet points would have been Marine sergeant, combat veteran, led Marines in Iraq. But now I'm looking at what happened in Iraq, and I'm starting to wonder what I was a part of, and whether I can be proud of it. Was I part of an evil thing? Because if I was, then I don't know who I am anymore, and I don't know what my identity is. Now, I remain proud of my service, but I understand where that Marine is coming from. I think any veteran who served in Iraq must be asking themselves some hard questions. I have friends who lost Marines fighting in the Battle of Fallujah only to watch that city fall to ISIS. I have friends who fought in Mosul. They all have questions about their service. But here's the thing, it's not on them alone. I know a reporter who embedded with US troops in Afghanistan recently, and he said to me, you know, just the other day I caught myself talking about the war in Afghanistan as if it was over, and I was just there. So what does that say about the rest of us? When it comes to war, they're the stories we should be telling ourselves, and the stories we like to tell ourselves, and the difference is often measured in human lives. The body count in Iraq passed 100,000 a long time ago, after all, most of them Iraqi civilians. Here's a story that used to be popular. We will be greeted as liberators and rapidly transition things over to the Iraqis. It was a story that promised easy answers. But when we, as a nation, embark on industrial-scale killing, there are no easy answers, only more and more questions. I think we need better stories, stories of war and stories of homecoming. The stories we tell ourselves decide what we, as a society, will accept from our leaders and what we push them to do. They also decide how we think about and treat the young veterans in our communities. One thing I hear a lot from civilians is, oh, I could never imagine what you've been through. In my case, it's not that hard. My job wasn't that crazy. I think, guess they mean that they don't think they could understand war. Well, since I joined, I've done a lot of reading from a lot of veterans, from the Greeks to the present day, and I don't know we've figured it out either. So help us out. Join the conversation. It's a vital one, I promise you. And that, I guess, is why I write stories. Also, the elements of a nine line are location, frequency, precedent, special equipment, number of patients, security mar marking, nationality, and NBC contamination. Thank you very much.